Hey guys, Tyler here. The Trill are a humanoid species in Star Trek, native to a planet of the same name in the galaxy's Alpha Quadrant. First introduced in the Next Generation episode, The Host, in the form of Odon, a Federation ambassador, a radically redesigned Trill species is heavily featured in Deep Space Nine, with Jadzia and Ezri Dax, among others. Trill make several appearances in various other spin-off series and films as well. Besides the two rows of dark spots that go down each side of their bodies, All the way. Trill are distinguished by another unique attribute that, for a long time, was apparently kept as a closely guarded secret. A small portion of the population harbors a sentient life form inside their bodies known as a symbiont. This symbiotic relationship plays a major role in Trill society and culture, as joined Trill have personalities that are a synthesis of the two beings. Key allies and eventually members of the United Federation of Planets since at least the 23rd century, the Trill are certainly one of the most unique aliens in Star Trek. But how exactly does their biology work, and how do they compare to our expectations about aliens in real life? Let's find out. Something that a lot of you have probably already realized by now. An alien biology video about the humanoid trill species was always going to be a video about the symbionts as well. Symbionts are teardrop-shaped vermiform, or in other words, worm-like life forms that can live for over 500 years. They naturally reside in underground pools, such as the ones found in the caves of Makala. They appear to communicate with each other via electrical signals, and they also have a limited form of communication with unjoined trill as well. After a symbiont is born, it can live for over a hundred years before being implanted in its first host. Dax, for example, was born in 2018 and was joined with Lila in 2168. A trill symbiont is joined with a host in a delicate surgical procedure in which it is placed into the abdomen. Following this, it develops a connection with the host body. After being joined for approximately 90 six hours, the symbiont is dependent on the trill host and vice versa. Neither can survive for an extended period of time if they become unjoined. Assuming a symbiont survives a host's unexpected death away from planet trill, it is removed and stabilized for emergency transport back to the home world for joining with another appropriate host. In some emergency situations though, the only way to save its life is for it to be joined with the closest trill not previously deemed suitable for carrying a symbiont, or even the closest non-trill under truly desperate circumstances. Symbionts carry the memories and personality of their previous hosts, and upon joining, a new trill host gains access to all of this as well. The brains of both the host and the symbiont are able to communicate, and their brainwaves even sync up. Over time, this contributes to the host's gradual but incomplete transformation of personality and mannerisms, a process that can sometimes be difficult and confusing. This is especially true if a host carries a highly experienced symbiont. As new hosts continue to discover and inherit quirks and other traits from several unique individuals that often clash with each other. In a way, every new host thus becomes a brand new person to a certain extent. Even their family names get replaced with the names of their symbionts. While as late as the 24th century, joining with other species such as humans could be dangerous to the human host, a symbiont could survive normally in a trill alien hybrid. By the 31st century, it became possible for humans and symbionts to join permanently, a practice that provoked extreme disapproval in Trill society. The series Bible for DS9 states that Trill symbionts are androgynous invertebrates and that they first joined with humanoid hosts centuries ago after an unprecedented environmental disaster, though some other sources suggest that this relationship goes back millennia which in evolutionary terms would make more sense, but I digress. 
One could be forgiven for mistaking this kind of symbiotic relationship with a parasitic one, especially given the, frankly, very weird implications of an invertebrate exercising so much influence over the neurology of a humanoid host. Even the word host implies some level of parasitism, and it's possible that the evolutionary link between hosts and symbionts on Trill started out this way. Some have even drawn parallels between Trill symbionts and the so-called bluegill aliens from the Next Generation episode Conspiracy. And as much as you guys may want me to talk about that right now, that's it's probably a story for another time. In any event, by the modern age, it's clear that, when you really think about it, the two Trill species really do benefit each other. Both gain knowledge and experience over multiple lifetimes, and the rigorous competition in Trill society to become joined may have produced a peaceful culture that values meritocracy, higher education, ethics, and personal and social responsibility. Indeed, candidates for joining often excel in their fields and hold multiple degrees. That's Dr. Jadzia Dax, thank you very much. A common belief in Trill society is that one in a thousand Trill is capable of being joined, but in reality, that number is closer to half the population. This myth is perpetuated very carefully, however, to prevent the symbionts from becoming a commodity, objects to be fought over, especially since there are only so many symbionts to go around. Unless the joined trill objects, a candidate host can request a specific symbiont. Joined trill have several tools at their disposal to deal with various aspects of their previous hosts. The telepathic Jantara ceremony, roughly equivalent to the Vulcan Faltor Pan ritual, allows a current host to divest their symbiont of previous hosts' personalities and memories, temporarily hosted in volunteers a process observed in the DS9 episode, Facets. This transfer process is performed and supervised by a guardian, creating an opportunity for closure as new hosts can confront past hosts directly. Similarly, the right of emergence can focus a single host's voice among the memories of another, allowing for more direct conversation in a new host's time of need. Regarding the humanoid hosts, save for those dark spots that once again go all the way down, all the way. Trill are once again some of the most human-like aliens in Star Trek. And to be honest, part of this comes down to production costs. But of course, it wasn't always this way. In The Host, Odon and his successor as Federation Ambassador, Kareel, sport forehead ridge makeup, as opposed to the iconic spots that go all the way down. All the way. They are also depicted as having an abdominal cavity that houses the symbiont, which has prompted various non-canon reference materials to classify the trill as marsupials. Down under. For DS9, it was originally planned for Jadzia and other Trill to basically look identical to Odon in terms of makeup. Actress Terry Farrell performed with forehead ridge makeup in multiple test shots, but Paramount executives were not satisfied with the appearance of the Trill. After watching dailies of Farrell in the DS9 pilot Emissary, Paramount issued a rare ultimatum about the alien's design. Insisting that Farrell's face not be intruded by a clunky prosthetic, the studio's decision resulted in the more common spots that Trill done in DS9 and beyond. Spots that go all the way down. All the way. Okay, I promise I'm gonna stop doing that. Or do I? Ultimately, the new Trill makeup was derived from a different alien species, the Creosians. Oh wait, wrong footage. The Creosians, a design that was subsequently approved by Paramount. And by the way, Creosian spots do not go all the way down. All the way. For the record, in-universe, the humanoid Trill could have evolved these spots for any number of reasons, as they appear on Trill of all ethnicities. As Farrell has observed, they're not much different from freckles, leopard spots, or zebra stripes. Such markings on an animal can serve various purposes, be it camouflage, 
thermal regulation, a fingerprint analog, or social bonding. Another likely reason that trill spots exist, in my opinion, is that they were a random mutation that was sexually selected for thousands, if not millions of years in trills past. Hence why the trait would have radiated throughout most of the population and go all the way down. All the way. See, I told you. Indeed, no canon explanation has been given to why most trill have spots while others do not, and why the latter group has forehead ridges that the former lack. Terry Farrell once suggested that these two populations come from different hemispheres on the trill homeworld, an explanation that was also given in Star Trek Picard for the Romulans. As for why the symbiont appears to exert more control over the host in the host, instead of the shared consciousness that we see in later installments. This could be because Odon had to suppress Riker's personality in order to complete his mission. That said, like various other attempts to reconcile the TNG and DS9 Trill, this explanation seems like a bit of a cop-out. Speaking of which, yet another inconsistency between the two depictions of the Trill is that Odon cannot use the transporter as it would harm the symbiont, while such a thing is never mentioned in DS9. Non-canon sources claim that the transporter restrictions were part of the Trill government's now defunct policy regarding secrecy around the symbionts, but this explanation also has lots of holes in it. Wouldn't the symbionts show up in regular medical scans? With all of this in mind, many consider the two to just be different species. And of course, the real world explanation is that the DS9 Trill are simply a retcon. Key to understanding the Trill's evolutionary history is an examination of their homeworld. The planet Trill, also known as Trillius Prime, is an M-class or Earth-like planet in the Trill sector on the very edge of Federation space. While we never get to see the star or stars Trill orbits on screen, according to the non-canon reference book Star Trek Star Charts, Trill is part of a binary system. The primary star appears to be a G-type yellow dwarf, and the secondary a K-type orange dwarf. These two suns, if Trill orbits them in a circumbinary or P-type orbit, may have contributed early on to more productive photosynthesis in Trill's biosphere. A strong magnetic field would also protect life on Trill's surface from more extreme UV radiation from the two suns. UV radiation that can cause DNA DNA molecules to mutate in all sorts of crazy ways, like producing skin spots that go all the way down. All the way. In terms of other planetary characteristics, as we learn in DS9, Trill's oceans sport a purple tint when viewed from space. This is likely the result of photosynthetic algae and plankton that don a purple pigmentation. There is some scientific basis to this, as the organic compound retinol, whose chemical structure is simpler than chlorophyll, appears purple in hue rather than green. This is because retinol-containing compounds absorb light in the green-yellow energy-rich part of the solar spectrum while reflecting red and blue light, whereas chlorophyll pigments absorb red and blue light, but little to no green light. Microorganisms with purple and green pigments often coexist in ecosystems where they utilize complementary regions of the sun's light spectrum, which is why we see normal-looking green vegetation on Trill's surface as well. But retinol's simplicity and ubiquity is why many astrophysicists believe that looking for purple reflections from the surfaces of exoplanets could serve as an indicator of biological activity. In fact, it's believed that earlier in Earth's history, roughly three and a half to two and a half billion years ago, purple may have been the dominant color of Terran plant life. So, like Trill, Earth's oceans may have looked purple too.
We don't know a ton about Trill prehistory, so to speak, or even its early endeavors in spaceflight in canon. The DS9 short story, First Steps, depicts Trill achievement of warp flight in the mid-21st century, and first contact with the Vulcans, much like Earth. The short story describes the Trill as adopting a xenophobic stance at first before opening their world up to commerce and trade with other cultures. They would have largely tamed their world by the 22nd century, becoming a Type 1 civilization on the Kardashev scale. Like various other alien species, they may have eventually settled on various colony worlds outside their home star system. Though, as I alluded to, there's no evidence that they ever had any intention of rapid, far-reaching expansion or conquest. Their relationship with the Federation would have presumably begun by the early 23rd century, given the presence of some Trill in Starfleet decades later. Speaking of, it's honestly a mystery as to when Trill actually joined the United Federation of Planets. Even in canon, prior to Discovery's third season, there are lots of arguments for and against their having membership already by the 24th century. Odon and Curzon both being Federation ambassadors who represent the Federation to other worlds, in Curzon's case, as far back as the 2280s, is certainly indicative that the Trill may have long been a Federation member, but the symbionts remaining a secret all the way to 2367 may point towards the Trill being a neutral ally rather than a member. Though that's not to say that Federation members can't have secrets. But again, the, the medical scans. Non-Federation citizens who want to serve in Starfleet are also required to obtain a letter of recommendation from a Starfleet commanding officer in order to attend Starfleet Academy. But it's never been indicated whether Jadzia, Ezri, or any of the other Trill who have served in Starfleet ever had to do this. And if they did, it probably would have been mentioned. Additionally, the non-canon Star Trek novel, Articles of the Federation, mentions a Trill president of the UFP, Madza Brawl, who served in the early 23rd century. Though Brawl, who probably wasn't joined, could have been an immigrant born on another Federation world. With all this in mind, I think that the most likely explanation is that the Trill probably did join the Federation by the early 23rd century, and it was just never mentioned because you know, not everything has to be spelled out like that. And as for how they managed to hold on to the secret of the symbionts for nearly 150 years, well, let's just say that maybe the episode, The Host, just doesn't fit with the timeline anymore. It's okay to admit it. Regarding the Trill taboo against so-called reassociation, while the practice is indeed technically forbidden by law, the degree to which said law is followed is up to the discretion of individual Trill. Some Trill take it as far as to no longer associate with a previous host's friends, relatives, or colleagues. Others have a very narrow interpretation, or, or maybe a less narrow, a, an alternative interpretation, and freely associate with the friends, family, and acquaintances of previous Trill hosts and symbionts, primarily avoiding those with whom they have been romantically involved. This is illustrated throughout DS9 with the relationship between Jadzia, later Ezri, Dax, and Benjamin Sisko. Dax's previous host, the Federation Ambassador Curzon, had been Sisko's mentor and close friend. Sisko affectionately dubbed Curzon Old Man, a moniker he continues to use for Jadzia and Ezri, also his platonic friends, after Curzon's death. In any event, the purpose behind the taboo against romantic reassociation is described this way on screen. Since the point of each successive host is for the symbiont to acquire a new lifetime's worth of experiences, Trill consider reconnecting with intimate relationships of past lives as 
unnatural and a waste of time. Joined Trill who do reassociate are exiled from Trill society, meaning their symbiont dies with that host. This is a dire consequence since for Trills, nothing is more important than protecting the life of a symbiont. Out of universe, another reason for the ban on reassociation, as conceived by DS9 writer, producer, and co-creator Michael Piller, is to avoid a quote-unquote aristocracy of the joined. Otherwise, Trill would, in Piller's words, only want to hang out with their close friends from 500 years ago, and it would become a really screwed up society. The ban was also conceived as an analogy for how homosexual relationships have often been treated in American society. Which brings me to another point. Any lengthy discussion of the Trill such as this one would be remiss in not mentioning how the Trill have, since their inception, served as a metaphor in a lot of ways for transgender people. This was indeed the closest Star Trek's writers felt that they could come to representation of this group at the time, especially given how much Paramount had historically discouraged overt discussion of LGBT identities and issues on the next generation. To this end, on several occasions throughout DS9, Jadzia expresses lines of dialogue whose subtext can be read as referring to the process of transitioning from one gender to another. One of the most prominent comes from the season two episode, Blood Oath, in which Jadzia has this exchange with the Klingon Core, a friend of Jadzia's previous host, Curzon. Oh, Curzon, my beloved old friend. <laughs> I'm Jadzia now. Oh, uh, well, Jadzia, my beloved old friend. Jadzia also talks quite a bit about the phenomenon of being a woman while having recently been a man, even outright saying, I was a young man once. This is not necessarily how most trans people would refer to themselves in the past tense, but as an alien metaphor for the trans experience, it certainly does offer a level of vicarious representation that was a major step forward for Star Trek in the 90s. Jadzia being more confident, lively, and outgoing after being joined can be compared to being more comfortable with oneself after transitioning or coming out. Of course, as many fans have pointed out over the years, metaphors and allegories can only go so far. On screen, it was only with the premiere of Star Trek Discovery in 2017 that the franchise now featured gay main characters. And in season three, we're introduced to the non-binary human character Adira Tal and their transgender joined Trill boyfriend, Gray, each played by a non-binary and transgender actor, respectively. So, to recap, the Trill are not one, but multiple species, humanoid hosts and symbionts, both native to the planet Trill. Annually, a few hundred members of one species, the slug-like symbiont, are biologically joined with a humanoid Trill in a sacred ceremony. Joined Trill possess personalities that are a mixture of the two beings and these individuals can access memories and skills of prior hosts, excepting the first one, of course. They are an important member of the United Federation of Planets that makes contributions to scientific research and are represented infrequently but visibly in Starfleet. Their culture is centered on rigorous meritocracy, education, and personal and social responsibility. Given the clear benefits that come with Trill officers, whether they're joined or unjoined, if you are a starship captain, would you recruit a Trill to serve on your crew? Why or why not? Let me know down below. Furthermore, another interesting set of philosophical questions. Are joined Trill more than the sum of their memories? Are symbionts really sapient in the same way that humanoids are? That is, are they people, or rather just a repository of memories? And finally, are the symbionts really parasites in the sacred nature of their joining a farce conceived by humanoid Trill in order to cope with being duped into letting these invertebrate creatures exert partial mind control. Yeah, like I said, 
let me know what you think down below. Clearly, this has been, to date, my longest alien species video, and this is in part because the Trill are my favorite species in Star Trek. I find myself fascinated by the concept of being able to carry skills and memories from one lifetime to another, and the opportunity to be different kinds of people throughout said lifetimes. So I wanted to be thorough in my exploration of this alien race. I hope that this video delivered on all of the fronts, just, just all of them, especially fleshing out some of the areas of Trill biology, history, and culture that are less explored. Also, I really just wanted to talk about the spots that go all the way down. All the way. And retinol and, and stuff like that. With all of that being said, thank you all so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to leave a thumbs up down below and don't forget to share it. That stuff really helps me out. If you haven't subscribed yet, be sure to do that as well so you won't miss future uploads and click the bell icon to receive all notifications. If you want to support my work even further, becoming a patron or a member is a great way to do so. Links to those, as well as my social media and merch store, are in the description. That's all I have for this week. Live long and prosper. Someday, our ability to love won't be so limited.